Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I wanted to share with you five of the best editing tips I could possibly give you. Now, I will say these are not technical tips in terms of how best to use the tone curve or how to color grade your photos, but these tips have made the biggest difference in me being able to get the most out of Lightroom or whatever editing program I'm using, and also the speed of my workflow and the enjoyment of actually editing photos. So with that being said, let's get into the first tip. So the first one is actually not one of the five main ones I'm giving in this video, but it's a bit of a starting point. But when you're inside Lightroom, I find it does the world of good to have all of your panels on the right hand side in the develop module in order of how you like to edit and the way in which you will go through and apply adjustments to your photo. So you'll notice in my develop module inside Lightroom, mine goes in order of length corrections, detail, transform, basic, tone curve, color mixer, calibration effects, and lens blur. That is not the default order, that is an order I've set up myself. And if you want to do this to sit in line with the way in which you edit photos, all you need to do is right click on any of these tabs and it will come up and say customize develop panel. And from there, you can then rearrange the order in which your settings sit. Okay, so onto the actual first official tip, shall we say, for this video number one. The reason I spoke about rearranging those panels first is because the next tip is all about applying your biggest adjustments and biggest changes first and editing in a certain order that works best for you. So again, going back to the way my Lightroom is set up, you'll see I've got lens corrections, detail and transform first. Now, those are three things that dramatically affect and impact the image. Lens corrections, obviously you're correcting any distortion or vignetting that is created by the lens. Detail is where all your sharpening is done or noise reduction, if you like that, and transform. Of course, you're cropping and reframing, vertical horizontal reframing. They affect your image drastically, and I believe, at least it works really well for me, that getting those out of the way first gives you a much better slate to work with for the rest of the image when you start messing around with lighting and color. It's also going to make your editing life a bit easier because you've already got the photo to a nice point that you're going to want it to look like. So if you crop an image up, for example, let's say I wanted this image to be four by three for whatever reason, and we go into the crop tool and we go ahead and select four by three and crop the image. Now, when I start applying adjustments like lighting and color, it already looks how I want it to look when I'm going to save it. So you're going to get a much better idea, a much better visualization in your head and on the screen of what your image is going to look like when you start applying further adjustments. Even going past sharpening, cropping and lens corrections, I would also recommend applying any major adjustments to your image in terms of the look. So on this image here, again, let's select the sky in this image just for the, the sake of this video. And let's say I've decided 100% I want a nice cool cold sky. So let's bring the temperature down to make it quite blue like this. It actually looks quite nice to be fair. So once I've done that and I've made my sky nice and blue and cold, I can then go start making adjustments to the rest of the image to make it sit in line with the sky and harmonize nicely with it. Whereas if I edited the whole image or the foreground or the building or anything in this image first and then made my sky very nice and cold and blue, I'm probably then going to have to go back into the rest of the image and fine tune it to sit back in line with the sky and harmonize it again. So it just makes more sense to me to do your biggest adjustments first, especially when it's ones that you 100% know you're going to want to apply to the image. Okay, so the next tip I've got for you here today is HSL visualization. Now, what this basically is, let's grab an image with a lot more color in it. So let's grab this shot of these flowers here. I actually took these in my parents' back garden, believe it or not. Well, that's probably not surprising, but it also shows that you can get great photos in back gardens, doesn't it? But anyway, let's go down to our color mixer or better known as the HSL panel and Likewise, with your basic tab inside Lightroom, which is your highlights, your shadows, all that good stuff, you probably know that you can hold Alt or Option on your keyboard and visualize the clipping in your image while you're holding it. So this exact same technique applies within every single panel inside the HSL. So the hue, saturation, luminance, you can use that same Alt or Option visualization inside there. But the reason I bring it up is because I feel like this is 
One of the most underrated features in Lightroom that isn't spoken about much. People always mention and always have mentioned clipping inside the basic panel, but this is so, so powerful. So if I go ahead, let's, let's move the purples on the luminance slider while I'm holding Alt or Option. And what you'll see is the rest of the image go to black and white. And as, as I shift that slider, you're going to see the effect applying to that color and that color only. Let's jump into saturation and let's pick the yellows because there's some yellows and greens in the back here. So let's hold Alt or Option on the keyboard, slide that around, there you go. The flowers have now gone black and white and you can see it affecting the yellows in the back. Now, why is this so good? Well, you, when you're looking at a photograph, and moving your hues around, your saturation around, your luminance around, and you're looking at the full image, sometimes it's really quite hard to visualize where the colors are actually moving, where the yellows actually sit. So let's jump back to that first image of the ruined building and let's go ahead into our saturation and bring our yellows up and our greens up without using it. So there you can see, obviously giving the whole image a pop, right? Let's reset them and now let's use the Alt or Option key on our keyboard to actually visualize it and bring the yellows up. And you can see there that there's quite a clear divide in where the yellows and greens actually are in the image. Let's now do it with the greens and bring the greens up and there you can see the greens. So visualizing them separately for me is one of the most underrated and most powerful ways to edit your colors, your hues, your luminance, everything like that inside Lightroom. Let's just do one more quick example of this in action so you can see how powerful it really is. So this image here, I'm looking specifically at the ISIS sign on the edge of the building there here. And let's say I want to move the reds around and see how nicely I can get that red on the wall looking. So I'm gonna go up to the red slider on saturation this time, and we're gonna boost that red while the rest of the image is going black and white. So what we're doing here is we can visualize in the background, there's actually some seats and a woman's piece of clothing there that there's also red on. And that might, I might have missed that. I might have just been looking at the ices on the wall and only caring about how that looks. Whereas in the background, I can see I actually don't want that woman's piece of clothing there to be that red. I'm sure photographers that have been doing photography for a while, editing images for a while, will already be aware of global and local editing techniques. But if you don't, a global adjustment is something that affects the entire image and everything in the image. So if I change the exposure on this photograph up and down, it affects the entire image. That is a global adjustment. It's applying an effect globally. But if I went ahead and grabbed my object selection tool, wherever that is, there it is, and drew on this pillar here to select the pillar like so. Just wait for that to apply. There we go. And you can see the mask there that it's made. And now I do the exposure here. That would be a local adjustment. So after that little ramble there, that is where my next tip comes into play. And it is to never ever neglect your local adjustments. I often see photographers that have took really beautiful images and they've only done a global edit from what I can see anyway, because it may be missing a major local adjustment that they could have made to take their image to the next level. So let me jump back and we've done this already in this video, but let's say this photograph here, this is how I shot this image and I globally edited it, did my saturation, my color grading, adjusted my highlight shadows and all of that good stuff and then saved it out and didn't do any local adjustments. Now, what I could do to this image to instantly make it better is select our subject here and correct that exposure. Let's put it back to where I think it looks best and there you go, a local adjustment that has made the image a lot, lot better. So try your best to not go through your editing process, applying stuff that affect the entire image and not think about how you could best improve ti even tiny little segments like a road sign that you could give a bit of a pop of a color to. Okay, on to tip number four for this video. And this one is kind of more of something to remember and think about when you're editing rather than actually like using tools inside Lightroom. I guess quite a lot of these are, but this tip is thinking about why you are applying every single adjustment to your image. You may have seen or heard all of those videos over YouTube that are like mistakes that beginner photographers should avoid, mistakes that I see beginner photographers make all the time. And without making one of those videos, this is one of those mistakes in my opinion is 
people thinking that because the adjustments are there to use in Lightroom, they should utilize each and every single one of them, but that's definitely not the case. Less is always more when it comes to editing. Back to this example image of the ruin. Let's say for whatever reason, I opened my image and I started slapping adjustments on. So let's go ahead and let's give it a curve look. Let's give it some green. Let's give it some vignetting. Let's give it a pop as well. And before I even clicked more than four or five adjustments, we've ended up with an image that, <laughs> I mean, you could be sitting there and being like, that is amazing. But no, to me, that doesn't look nice at all, not visually pleasing. And there is also no thought process behind them of whether I actually need those adjustments. So let me just undo all of those, look at the image again and say to myself, could this image do with a vignette in order to drive more attention into the ruin in the middle of the photograph? If I say, yeah, I think we could do with some more line of sight, some more draw into the center of the frame to bring more of the viewer into the point of the photograph. If that is the case, if I'm answering yes to that, then I may go ahead and play around with a vignette in order to do that. But if the answer is no, I'm not even gonna think about it. I'm not going to apply it. I don't need to. And oftentimes you really don't need many adjustments on your photographs. If your raw files are good from the get-go, they're good enough for you to do little editing to. I believe we're on to the last tip, aren't we? I've kind of lost count, but I know them in my head. So I believe we're on to the last tip here. And this one is all about color accuracy and color accuracy being pretty key, in my opinion, to good images. And again, this would be one of those things I would include in a mistakes beginner photographers make, blah, blah, blah. I would include that in this because I do see it a lot, a lot, a lot. I see it on Instagram a lot. I see it on people's websites a lot. And it's basically where photographers have taken a photograph in a certain season that has done really well. Let's say you take a beautiful photograph in the autumn time, beautiful oranges, gold and yellows, all of that good stuff, the light was beautiful. And they've got really, really positive feedback from that photograph. It's done really well somewhere on social media, whatever it may be. So going forward, they then try to kind of match all of their new images to that style, that theme, that look, that color. But that doesn't work because images should represent the scene at the time. I know some people have like a really artistic style that they carry across all of their work. And that's fantastic. That's awesome if you found that. But let's just go into an example and I'll tell you what I mean. So let's take a look at this autumn shot here of this long exposure uh, stream running through the trees here. We've obviously got some oranges, some very muted greens. So let's say I'd built up maybe a couple of months worth of autumn photos on my social media, on my website, all of that stuff. And they all had, you know, autumn scenes, beautiful oranges, beautiful yellows. And then I went ahead and took this photograph and didn't want to post it because it didn't sit in line with it. Or like I say, maybe I'd had such good feedback on those other photos that I felt then that all of my images kind of had to follow those same colors and that same editing. So let's say I went in, let's go into the hues. Let's take the greens and the yellows and all of that stuff over to the oranges and obviously this is going to be quite extreme because I'm trying to get the hues or the look of the photo to sit in line with this photograph. I see this all the time. I see photographers that have took a photo in the spring or the summer and they've tried to match the look of it to a photo they've took in the autumn. Maybe somebody's trying to match a bright blue sunny blue sky day to moody photos that they took in Iceland. I don't know, but color accuracy for me is key. Keeping your colors as true to what colors are in real life for me doesn't confuse the viewer. If you spend enough time editing, learning editing, and the more and more you develop a photography style, you can create a harmonizing editing look across all your images, regardless of when they were shot or what colors are present in the photograph. You've got to remember that photography style actually comes way more from the camera than it does your editing. Editing style is a separate thing to photography style because let's say you shoot garage doors, right? Your style is going to be the garage door photographer. And then the way that you edit it, as long as you keep maybe your saturation, your hues and how dark and light your images are consistent, they're still going to look pretty nice together regardless of how you've edited them because you've come up with such a distinct garage door photography style. 
<laughs> that example is ridiculous. But you get what I'm saying, right? I do see it a lot and I do think that you're much better off playing around with like how saturated you want your colors, how bright and dark you want your image, rather than messing around with the hues or changing colors in your photographs to try and again, make them look like something they are not. All right, that's gonna wrap up this video. Now you've got these editing tips under your belt. I recommend checking out this video right here next to see free tips on how to take more intentional photographs. And with that said, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.